Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the IVS seminar, as usual, every week, pretty much. So today's seminar is going to be given by uh, Luke, a PhD student uh, with us. He did his bachelor and master in, in Nijmegen, then moved to Leuven for his PhD. And as someone who uh, really likes uh, bouldering, yeah, he started climbing the PhD mountain about three and a half years ago or so. And he's currently approaching the tip yeah, with, uh, with the internal and public defenses planned this year already. Yeah, and today he is going to be talking about uh, binary stars, an observational population uh, of eclipsing binaries. So the floor is yours, Luke. Back. Yes, there we go. Um, so to repeat that, thank you for the introduction. Um, and indeed, I'm going to talk about how to get to an observational population study of eclipsing binary stars. So I'll give you a quick overview of broadly what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'll start with a very, very brief introduction about what eclipsing uh, binaries actually are. And I'll talk about some of the basic properties that we are looking for, um, and specifically the ones that I'm most interested in. Um, then I'll talk about how that, uh, those properties are encoded into the light of uh, these eclipsing binaries, and uh, how we can approach decoding that light. Um, and then I'll tell you about how I uh, applied this um, knowledge to an automated pipeline for analyzing these light curves. And then finally, I get to the point where I'm all working towards, um, which is the observational population study um, of eclipsing binaries. So to start off, well, I suppose you all know what a star is. Just to, to remind you and to make a little uh, parallel to uh, eclipsing binaries, um, of course, we all know gravity is the main antagonist in stars. It pulls everything uh, towards the center. And thus, force is um, counteracted by uh, two other ones, mainly, um, uh, mainly the gas pressure. Um, and then we also have photon pressure fro coming from the nuclear reactions uh, happening in the core. So there's also a sort of balance of uh, forces in uh, binary stars. And it looks a bit like this. So instead of uh, holding back the material of the stars, it holds, uh, gravity holds together the two uh, stars. But instead of uh, directly falling into each other and colliding uh, spectacularly, they um, actually keep missing each other because of the angular momentum of the orbit. So that's what keeps them in, um, in this um, sort of force equilibrium. The only ingredient that we still need then to make an eclipsing binary is to make the inclination close to 90 degrees so that these both stars move in front of each other um, and block each other's light. So I included a very, very brief uh, history of uh, binary systems, um, just to get a little bit of an overview. And um, the very first binary star was actually um, only discovered in uh, around 1650. Uh, that was when Benedetto Castelli asked Galileo Galilei to observe for him a star that he uh, suspected of being uh, either weird or, or double. And this was the star Mizar. And so Galileo, with his telescope, confirmed that there were indeed two light sources here. So that was the first visual binary. And that was actually fairly soon uh, followed by two more, Gamma, Gamma Arietis and uh, Acrux. And um, it was only much later that uh, the first eclipsing binary was discovered by John Goodrick, and this was the star Algol. Um, again, uh, quite some time later, uh, Carl Vogel confirms that Algol is a binary with spectral lines, so now using spectra um, instead. And it also followed that uh, Mizar, uh, one of the components of Mizar, uh, component A, was actually itself a binary, um, also uh, in that same year, confirmed by spectral lines. And then the last one that I want to mention is uh, kind of a special one, uh, which is discovered by Jonathan Stebbins in 1911, so that's actually quite recent, 
which is the first uh, binary star that had found to be eclipses and double spectral lines. So whereas the, uh, the other spectral lines that the observers saw moving back and forth due to the um, uh, radio velocities of these stars, this one had two, uh, both the stars visible in the spectral lines um, and mov moving back and forth in opposite uh, directions. And what I want to draw your attention to is that these um, discoveries of uh, new, with new types of uh, techniques, they all have this kind of nice um, uh, time uh, in between of about 100 years. Um, and I didn't include that here, but actually after that one, you can make another period of 100 years, and then we get to uh, using uh, satellites for doing our observations. So eclipses. Um, so what ex actually is an eclipse? It's quite simply the reduction, uh, a reduction of the light uh, of a star that we see. And in principle, this is quite simple to measure. You just point your camera at a star or at the sky in general and keep taking pictures so that you can measure uh, and monitor the brightness of uh, those stars. And at some point, you might see that one of the stars uh, starts to become uh, less bright. And that might be an eclipse. So due to the, um, the way this, uh, these measurements work, we are a little bit, um, or a little bit, a lot um, limited to short periods. And that is mainly because of two things. So we have um, an observational bias, which is due to the fact that uh, eclipses are a short-lived phenomenon. So uh, once we have a dip, and uh, yeah, we see the light come back up to the previous level, it's in many cases that the light in between the eclipses is just flat. So uh, nothing is happening to the star, it's just constant, and we have no clue that any eclipse has ever happened after that. So we have to um, actually observe continuously for a long time to have a good chance of finding um, the next eclipses. And so that limits us to uh, lower periods. What also limits us to lower periods is geometry. So uh, you can imagine uh, a star system, binary star system. If the two stars are very close together, there's actually uh, a lot of different orientations where the two stars will still uh, cover an area um, of the other star in, in our line of sight. But when we put the stars very far apart, then that angle that where that happens, that becomes quite small, actually. So just from a geometric um, standpoint, we also limit ourselves to lower uh, periods. So here, just to have two uh, examples of uh, what these eclipsing light curves might look like, uh, here a fairly uh, mundane one where the eclipses are very, very clearly present. And then a second one to show um, that, indeed, these eclipses can also be quite hard to find, um, where the eclipses themselves are um, sort of low signal to noise, or it might be noise, like here, but it might also be other things going on, like intrinsic variability of the star that obscures the presence of eclipses. So then I get to the properties of these eclipsing binaries. And there's generally two uh, broad categories that we can uh, put them in. And the first one is uh, intrinsic uh, properties to the stars. So I'm talking about the temperature, for example. The other one is related to your orbit. And those, for me, are some of the most important uh, ones here. Um, and I'll talk about six most important uh, properties for my purposes, at least. Um, First of all, and most importantly, the eccentricity. Um, I'll say a bit more about why this eccentricity is so interesting for me. Um, but here is an example of uh, two orbits. Uh, one is clearly circular, and the other has uh, elongated shape, or elliptical shape. And in the circular orbit, we uh, say that the eccentricity is zero. In the other orbit, we have some uh, higher um, value of eccentricity. And um, before we get to the next property, I'm actually going to uh, put a, bit, a little bit uh, of an interlude uh, to discuss this kind of orbit uh, picture. So 
uh, what I drew uh, before and then what I'm going to continue drawing is the relative orbit where we put one of the stars um, in the middle and basically stationary and then the other star is rotating around that. Um, the other view, which is basically if you as an observer are standing still outside of the system and looking at it, then you actually see two orbits. So you see both orbits rotating around some uh, center, which is of course the center of mass. Um, and these two orbits, uh, turns out, quite nicely add up in scale. So the semi-major axes, they add up exactly to the semi-major axis of that big orbit. And this view just simplifies it a bit and makes it easier to understand. Especially when we are uh, adding eccentricity, because then it will look like this. So the relative orbit is fairly simple to um, grasp in one uh, uh, blink. But uh, if we draw it in absolute orbits, then we get something more complicated. And in this case, the, um, the red points that I drew here, those are the foci of the elliptical orbits. Um, and one of these will uh, overlap. And that will be sort of the common uh, center point where, they, where both stars um, rotate around. And again, the mathematics works out. Uh, it's less easy to see in this case, but still that semi-major axis adds up exactly to the one of the larger orbits. And, as might be sort of visible from the drawing as well, these uh, orbits are all exactly the same shape. So the eccentricities that we measure are equivalent. So that's good, that the, the mathematics at least works out and enables us to look at these orbits in a simpler way. Okay, then the next property. So, um, if we have an orbit that is not circular, we can of course rotate that orbit around in space and that alters the way we will uh, perceive it. So if now an observer is uh, looking at this from the left, so he sees this uh, system eclipsing, the argument of periestron measures at what point in the orbit the stars will be in closest approach. So at this point, it will be directly in line with the observer, but then here it is rotated to be at some different angle. Next one is another angle, and this is the inclination, as I've uh, mentioned before. So this will just um, measure how far um, away from fully, uh, yeah, totally eclipsing these uh, stars are. And in the case where the two stars go directly through each other's center line, uh, that's an inclination of 90 degrees. Um, and when the stars are in, or the, the orbit of the stars is in the plane of the sky, that is zero degrees of inclination. Then we have the sum of radii, so we get to the intrinsic um, properties now. And I put a little extra note here, it's actually the scaled um, sum of radii, meaning that um, what we measure actually in uh, the eclipsing binaries is not the absolute uh, size of these stars, but it is actually the size of the stars compared to their orbit. So in the drawing as well, I drew the uh, sizes of the orbits exactly the same, and just the stars are now bigger. Of course, that also works the other way. We can have the same size of stars, just a bigger orbit. Then we can also get information about the uh, ratio of these radii, so uh, we can sort of know which of the stars is the bigger one. And finally, we have the ratio of the surface brightnesses. So this is directly related to the temperatures of the stars, and it will tell us um, which of the two stars uh, is brighter per surface area. So the light encoding. So I've told you about all these nice properties, but unfortunately we cannot um, directly measure these properties. Um, and so we have to come up with some way to um, figure them out from the light curve. Um, luckily, they are all encoded in, that, uh, in those light variations that we see, the eclipses. Um, and what we can uh, do to uh, find them is we need to identify important points in the orbit. And I'll uh, say more about what those points are. What we can also do to help ourselves a bit is choose different parameterizations. So instead of just taking the uh, orbital property or the yeah, orbital and intrinsic properties that I've 
uh, just talked about, we can diff uh, use different parameterizations that might help us um, measure these uh, quantities in an easier way. So first of all, I'll talk about a system of twins. So that just means the stars are identical to each other in both size and temperature. Um, what happens for these twins if they start um, eclipsing each other, they'll first, uh, there first comes a point where the two stars are in, uh, just in contact. So of course these stars are not actually colliding, but their projected uh, stellar disks will at some point um, just be touching. And this is what we call uh, first contact. So from that, um, or until that point, the light curve, um, if nothing else of variability is going on, the light curve is just flat. From that point on, the light will be decreasing. Because of course the two stars are, uh, or one star is blocking the light of the other. Until some point where both of them are exactly uh, overlapping. So in this case, of two exactly the same stars at exactly 90 degrees of inclination, of course, two, the two stars completely um, overlap. So we reach actually a, a flux level that is exactly half of the total flux level. We use here um, a relative uh, flux level which is normalized to one. So after that point, of course, the uh, flux comes back up until we have that point of contact, which we then call last contact. So for these twins, uh, what the light curve uh, on a, as a whole looks like uh, is like this. So we have two um, a primary, secondary, and a primary eclipse here. And both the primary and secondary look identical. Uh, and they have these um, specific triangular um, sizes, uh, sorry, not sizes, but uh, shapes at the bottom. And I have marked here the flux level of half. So what happens now if we have different sizes of stars? Well, there's two main differences, which is uh, the flux level that we reach as a minimum immediately jumps up. Because of course, if the small star uh, is in front of the big star, it will never completely cover all of the light. Um, and the other big thing is that uh, the eclipses will no longer be triangular, but they will be more box-shaped. Uh, box so they have a flat uh, underside. And um, I'll show you why that is. So now we actually have a few more reference points. Again, we have first contact, just with a different size star. And then the flux starts uh, decreasing until we have a point where the, um, the smaller star, in this case, that is in front, reaches the uh, inside of the uh, stellar disk of the other, uh, the bigger star in this case. And that's what we call uh, internal tangency. So the, the two circles are in, in tangency internally, uh, quite literally. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, if these stars, if we assume uniform brightness over their disks, the light will be at its minimum. And so the bottom of the eclipse will be completely flat from that point. So of course, we cannot necessarily distinguish this point where the star reaches the center of the bigger um, disk. Uh, but we can then as well um, find the last uh, internal tangency point. And again, the eclipse takes um, the same time until the um, last contact point. Now, about, these, um, about the temperatures, if we uh, change the temperature of the smaller star in this case to make it uh, cooler, so I've yeah, now drawn it as a, a yellow star instead of a blue one. Uh, we start altering the depths of the primary and the uh, secondary eclipse. And so they will uh, change in a different uh, amount, as shown here by the previous light level at point 8. The primary eclipse will now be deeper. And why is this? Well, the smaller star, which is now the cooler one, once it starts moving in front of the bigger one, uh, the hotter one, it will block exactly, of course, the amount of uh, area that uh, the smaller star, uh, of the smaller star. Um, but the area that is blocking is of the higher temperature star, so it has a higher surface brightness, uh, or there's more light per surface area. And so 
Compared to the other situation where it is behind, still, of course, the same area of stellar disk is covered, namely that of the smaller star. But the smaller star is cooler, so less light per surface area is covered. And so that's why in relative flux we now see this um, the difference between primary and secondary. So next, uh, if we increase the sum of radii, uh, what we actually uh, essentially do is we make the, um, uh, the time that it takes from the first contact to the last contact take longer. So the eclipses, they both uh, equally uh, widen in, in duration. Um, and if we uh, uh, think of the, the reference points again, that first uh, contact point, simply because the relative size of the stars is larger compared to the orbit, will be happening earlier, because they will get into contact uh, earlier. Then the eccentricity, I've actually um, divided this up into a, uh, two, two components. So the tangential component is the component of eccentricity uh, in um, the plane of the sky. And so in the drawing of the orbits here, I have made them sort of unequal on both sides, indicating uh, exactly as from the top-down view that on one side um, it will have less orbit to cover than on the other side. And that is already one indication for um, the star taking a longer time to go around this way than around this way. But, of course, additionally, we have to uh, deal with Kepler's laws, which tell us that if the stars are closer together in the orbit, they'll be moving faster than when they're far away. So both those effect, uh, effects uh, make it that the, uh, star will be, uh, the secondary star will be taking much less time on this side of the um, orbit than on this side. And that will make it so that the secondary eclipse it changes its position uh, compared to the primary. So that it will take less time between the primary eclipse and the secondary eclipse, while the time between secondary eclipse to next primary eclipse will increase. Then we have the other component, of course, the radial component. So that's the component in the direction of the line of sight. Um, and what this does is, uh, in a sense, similar. We still have this case where at one, uh, at one point, star is going much faster, uh, and at the zero point, the secondary is moving much slower. Uh, but in this case, it won't change the position of the secondary eclipse. It will uh, make the primary eclipse here uh, narrower and the secondary eclipse wider or longer in duration. And so we can see from these uh, schematic views that um, when the star is in front, so when it's going here, the orbital um, uh, velocity is much larger. So the time from first contact to last contact will just be shortened. And the opposite for when it is in the slow part of its orbit, then it will be uh, taking longer. Okay, that sounds all fine and well, and quite easy, actually. Um, so why uh, is this actually quite hard? Well, inclination makes our lives a lot more difficult. Um, if we look at all these effects uh, separately, it's all uh, quite understandable and, and um, we can easily find the effects back in the light curve. But combining all of them, then it starts to become um, degenerate. So uh, just as a, a, a bit of a help to the uh, uh, imagination, I've uh, again drawn the reference points this time uh, with the 90-degree um, inclination, and then this one is for just a few degrees uh, less inclination of 86. Um, but already we see that, if I go back and forth between these, the eclipse looks very different. And so the main difference that we see is, of course, that we are missing now two reference points here at the bottom. So internal tangency actually doesn't happen anymore. Um, and this actually makes us lose information, which is not very nice if you want to model things. Uh, another thing that happens, and I'll show you more later, is that the um, first contact and the last contact happen at different times. 
So uh, I have made a bit of a uh, schematic uh, view for that here. So what the inclination will do is that it reduces the duration of the eclipses through this mechanism. So uh, the blue star here is in the same position. And the uh, secondary, the blue yellow star here is uh, in the top one at 90 degrees inclination. And here it is at uh, some different inclination. And as you can see, the point of first contact happens a little bit later in the orbit, um, thus making the, the duration of the eclipse uh, shorter. And as you recall, the uh, sum of radii, that was related to our eclipse duration. So this will directly influence uh, what we measure for the radii. Then if we combine inclination with eccentricity as well, so more things happen. Um, the first one is that the depths of the eclipses can change independently now. So if we look at uh, this schematic diagram, um, I've drawn it in such a way that uh, the star, the secondary star is in closest approach at the uh, backside when it's going behind the uh, blue star and it is furthest away in front. And as you can see, uh, just from geometric effects, there's a lot uh, more area covered when it's going when it's going behind than uh, is the case when it's going in front of the star, and yeah, area covered is directly proportional to eclipse depth, and so this influences our brightness uh, brightness ratio measurements because that was related to the eclipse depths. And the other thing is that the durations can also change independently. And that is by the following effect. So I've drawn the same uh, orbit, actually. Closest approach is still at the back. Um, and now we can see that the um, orbital velocity at the back is much larger, because the star is closer. Um, and so this uh, time from first to last contact will be shortened. And the opposite is true for the other position, where uh, now the star is further away. So it's going much slower. And then the eclipse time, even though you can see that from the inclination itself, the duration of the eclipse has shortened, the actual total effect might be that it is uh, longer because of this lower orbital velocity. And that then influences the measurement of our radial uh, eccentricity component itself. So I've already showed you uh, one uh, new parameterization that we can use, um, and that is the uh, tangential and radial component of eccentricity in uh, mathematical terms e cosine omega and e sine omega, where um, omega is the argument of uh, periastrum. And I show you as well here the uh, formulae that you can use to get back to uh, the eccentricity uh, itself uh, that you might want to use. So another um, parameterization that we can use and can be very useful is to transform the sum of radii to a new parameter called phi zero. And this is absolutely not a new thing, um, existed in the, in the literature for a while. Um, and what it actually does, it more or less directly measures the uh, duration of both eclipses uh, added together. And this turns out to be, uh, turns out to be much less um, degenerate with both the inclination and the eccentricity of the orbit, whereas uh, the sum of radii is uh, very uh, tied to those uh, two measurements. And so this is the uh, full um, analytical equation to get to, um, uh, that relates this uh, phi zero to i, the inclination, and uh, the eccentricity um, E, as well as the sum of radii. So here, the radii are the absolute radii, but because we uh, divide by A, the semi-major axis, these are relative um, scales. And so if we uh, rewrite that to solve for the uh, scaled sum of radii, we get out this formula. And so the effect of this can be quite pronounced. And I show this here in a, a corner plot uh, of an MCMC run uh, 
for these uh, for solving for these parameters. So here on the left we have the original uh, properties that we might want to uh, measure. And as you can see, there's, uh, for example, in this one, um, a very, very nice banana shape between eccentricity and argument of periastron, meaning that the two are very, very correlated with each other. And same is true for uh, the sum of radii with the inclination and the sum of radii and the um, ratio of radii. Um, and so if we look then at the right, with the new parameterizations, we can see that for E cosine omega and E sine omega, all of a sudden that banana shape is completely gone. It's almost a circular distribution now. So we have basically lifted that degeneracy. Great. Um, and for phi zero, it's a little bit less pronounced, but still very, very um, effective. Uh, both the um, uh, inclination and uh, ratio of radii is much less uh, correlated now. So then, I get to the application. Of course, we all want to uh, model our uh, things, and uh, we have two uh, uh, steps of for this. Of course, the first one is the forward model, where we use uh, a generated eclipsing binary light curve uh, model, uh, or basically the other way around. So we go from a set of parameters as input to that um, EB light curve model. And that's fairly, uh, a fairly simple problem, uh, asterisks. Um, <laughs> but of course, what we want to solve is the backwards problem. So um, where we have our nice uh, data of an eclipsing binary light curve, and we want to get out our parameters. So the way uh, that a human might do this uh, looks broadly as follows. So you might uh, pick the right uh, orbital period from your periodogram or your favorite other uh, period finding algorithm. Um, and then you use your expertise to guess an initial set of parameters for uh, your eclipsing binary. And this, of course, is a very vague <laughs> step. Um, then you might want to play a bit with these parameters to get closer and closer to the actual uh, true solution. And finally, then you can use uh, a fitting algorithm to make corrections to that um, set of parameters to get to your final answer. Um, afterwards, you can then subtract your eclipsing binary model from the data to then uh, look at the residuals and try to interpret them, which is, of course, also a very broad and vague step uh, but yeah, a human mind can, can do this. Of course, as you might have already guessed, um, only one of these steps is uh, already implemented and completely automated by uh, computer algorithms. Um, and so uh, what I've been working towards is uh, to automate the, the rest of these steps and focusing on the first steps to get towards the... Um, uh, fitting of the eclipsing binary model. And I'll go uh, a little bit through these steps one by one uh, with the help of some uh, diagrams. So here I show uh, a nice um, periodogram of uh, any uh, or, or just a, uh, an eclipsing binary uh, system. So we see broadly two uh, big components um, or big features here. The first, of course, is the um, big uh, series of harmonic uh, sinusoids. So we have the orbital uh, frequency here in the dashed uh, line, and then at integer multiples of that um, will be all the uh, peaks of the harmonic uh, frequencies. Um, the other feature, of course, is this um, other blob of random-looking uh, peaks, which might be any other intrinsic variability that is happening in the light curve. And so, talking about the light curve, that might look like this. So, on top is the data with, over top of that, actually, the model of uh, all of these sinusoids after uh, iterative pre-whitening. So, that is trying to uh, uh, decompose that um, uh, light curve into a set of sine waves. And, uh, yeah, it falls quite nicely on top of that. So if we subtract it, we also get out 
uh, something that looks uh, like it is a good um, uh, residual of white noise. Next, we might want to uh, find these and uh, identify these harmonic uh, sinusoids. So we try to uh, find the um, orbital period in a reliable way, and then we can identify at integer multiples all of these uh, peaks. And in, the, in that way, we separate them out from um, all the other intrinsic variability that is not happening at um, orbital harmonic frequencies. And then that might look like this. So at the top now, we have everything that is going on at uh, orbital harmonics. So in this case, that is mainly just the eclipses. Uh, and then in the bottom, after we subtract that, we are left over with uh, whatever intrinsic variability, uh, like pulsations, for example, might be happening in the light. So what I've done here now is I've taken that orbital period, um, or rather, I've taken that uh, time series of data and uh, cut it into uh, equal pieces of length of the orbital period. And then I've put all these pieces on top of each other. And that's what we call a uh, folded uh, uh, time series. And so then, if you pick the right orbital, frequent, uh, orbital period, of course, the eclipses fall nicely on top of each other. And we might uh, be able to see better uh, their shape and position. And so I've not actually drawn anything on here by hand. This is all done by the computer. Um, so the computer has uh, identified where the position of the eclipses is and also identified their uh, edges or first and last contact points. So here's another example of that with a slightly different uh, eclipses uh, and a nice example of a flat eclipse. And here's another example where the eclipses are much less prominent uh, compared to the rest of the light curve. And we can also see that in the periodogram here, where the series of harmonics is actually much lower in amplitude than all the rest of the um, frequencies. And then in the end, what we want to get to is that uh, fitting of an eclipsing binary light curve model, which is here in top, uh, what's happening. Um, Note that the uh, light between the eclipses here is constant, as my model does not include any um, other variability at that uh, stage. But it, the eclipses itself, it does model quite well, uh, as we can see from the residuals, where there's not much left uh, happening at the um, points of the eclipses. So then I finally get to uh, where uh, what I'm all working towards. Um, the population study. And first of all, uh, I just want to uh, go over uh, the uses of uh, such an automated uh, analysis routine, which first of all, of course, it's quite a general tool that uh, many other astronomers could also use. So especially the first part is very general in the sense that it just um, has an iterative writing uh, procedure um, that, uh, for example, other people in the SSSmology group already have been using. Um, and what it also does, it will greatly simplify the in, uh, individual uh, eclipsing binary studies just by um, enabling uh, anyone to run that automatic pipeline and start off from a pretty uh, close to uh, the right uh, parameter um, set. Um, and lastly, what I uh, am working towards myself is that population study and focusing on the circularization of the orbits. And so circularization refers to the effect of tides. And tides, just like uh, we have on Earth, is uh, the effect of a gravitational body on, um, on Earth, the, the water in the oceans, which will uh, have a bulge on one side and a bulge on the other side of the Earth. Same happens in uh, stars if they're close enough together. Um, and that will have an effect on uh, both the rotation and the orbit uh, of those stars. And because of this um, deformation that happens, um, this process is, is dependent on the internal physics of the stars. So by studying this, we might um, try to uh, find something out about the internal physics of stars as well. 
And um, all of this will, of course, also depend on some of the other properties of the stars, uh, some of those that I'm uh, also measuring with my um, analysis. And so we might want to find out uh, some of the dependence on these properties of this uh, circularization. Uh, and finally, what I want to find out as well is what is the influence of pulsations? So is there a difference between stars that are showing pulsations and stars that are not um, showing pulsations? Um, are there differences or maybe are they exactly the same? And what would that mean? So I've mentioned tides and um, tides are something that also have an, uh, can have an effect on the light curve uh, in the form of ellipsoidal variability. Um, so I've already shown before, uh, but I'll show here again, a light curve with eclipses, but then in between the eclipses, something else is happening. And actually the light um, of the stars becomes brighter. And this is because uh, at these points in between the eclipses, we see the stars from their sides instead of uh, when they're aligned to each other. And that is exactly the point where the two stars are um, uh, stretched out by, by each other. So there's more surface area of each star, and taking in first order approximation that the surface brightness stays the same, it will just be uh, more light in total. So there will be a brightening. Um, so here, uh, a view of what that might look like in an eccentric orbit. So in the eccentric orbit, we might have the case that on the furthest um, uh, separation, the stars might not be um, uh, deformed at all. But at the uh, other end, uh, both stars um, might be very uh, stretched out because they're very close together. And the effect of this is that at this closest approach, the uh, primary star will exert a torque on the secondary star. And this torque, because it is variable with the orbit, it will actually slowly circularize that orbit. Um, so circularization is something that we can also um, model from a theoretical basis. And this is then what we might uh, find for uh, some of the uh, time scales of uh, circularization. So what we can uh, try to uh, compare the observations with is um, yeah, the, the time scales that it takes for the orbit to go from some uh, arbitrary eccentricity to a circular orbit. And there are actually two formulae, as you, as you can see here. Um, that's because there's a very different physics going on for stars that have a convective outer envelope and stars that have a radiative outer envelope. Um, but what is uh, the same between these two is that both of these functions are a very, strong, uh, very strongly dependent on the orbital period, or in a, uh, different words, the orbital separation. And that is just because uh, there's a very strong dependence of the strength of these tides on uh, how close to the two stars uh, approach each other. And that means that when we look at the population as a whole of eclipsing binaries, or binaries in general actually, what we expect to see is that the eccentricity at the lowest periods, so where stars are closest together, is basically completely um, gone. So the stars... Um, have very rapidly uh, circularized in, in that uh, regime, and so we expect to measure only circular orbits. Um, and then at some, uh, after some critical uh, period is reached, we then expect to see a very broad uh, eccentricity distribution as the stars have not had the time to circularize their orbit. And so to fill that diagram, we of course need stars. And that's what I've been uh, working towards uh, with my collection of uh, eclipsing binaries. Um, and I've been using the TESS satellite imaged here um, to get there. I won't say too much about that in this um, presentation because it's a bit too long otherwise, but I'll just quickly show you uh, the first uh, result of that, uh, collecting about 3,000 eclipsing binaries across the sky. Um, and um, yeah, it's a quite pretty picture, I think, to look at. But uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, and so, actually, I'm going to uh, say, um, stay tuned for the test EBs, because 
I still have to analyze these with um, my pipeline. What I have done uh, is something else. I have looked at the Kepler eclipsing binary. So this is from a known uh, catalog of uh, eclipsing binaries coming from the Kepler observations, different uh, satellite. And what is known in that, in that catalog is the orbital period, but what was not known yet in that catalog was the eccentricities. And so I've measured these, um, and it looks something like this. So in broad terms, uh, it follows the expected shape uh, that we um, uh, yeah, expect from theory. So then for the test EBs, what I want to, uh, the, the answers that I want to question for those is, so what is the temperature dependence uh, of the eclipsing binaries um, for the, the, on the circularization? Um, I also want to see what is the effect of pulsations? What role do they play? And uh, of course, an important question, does the theory work? Uh, hopefully it does. And as a conclusion, uh, I hope I've convinced you all that EB light curves are awesome. Uh, we can get a lot of information out of them. Um, and I certainly think they are. Um, and we need uh, automated data analysis uh, routines for the huge um, amounts of data that we are nowadays uh, getting from our uh, observing surveys. And the combination of these is actually the way to get to an observational population study for testing the tidal theory. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, for a very interesting talk. Uh, time for questions. Start from the front. Hey, Luke, thanks for the talk. Uh, maybe a naive question, like how good is this pipeline uh, for exoplanet detection, for example? <laughs> um, exoplanets are, of course, uh, harder, uh, and uh, they're harder in some ways and easier in other ways, but they're harder in the detection part, because, uh, of course, their effect on, on the light is much smaller. Um, in principle, many of the techniques uh, used for eclipsing binaries uh, is interchangeable with um, planets, and there's actually nothing in the pipeline that uh, prevents you from using it uh, on a, um, uh, planets. It's just, yeah, it might be a lot harder. Hey, so uh, one quick historical note. Uh, I think there are also claims of Egyptians being aware of the variability of algal, although they had no idea it was binary, of course. Uh, the other question I have is just curiosity. You were talking about all these effects. Is time of flight of photons measurable in some of them? It would fake uh, non-zero eccentricity, for instance. Um, so I think yes. Um, so you're referring to the effect that when the uh, one star is moving towards us, then... Um, it's if you think about a high mass ratio system, so one would be fixed, then the point where the eclipse happens, more or less the light that's being blocked, is further away from us. So I it see, takes yeah. longer for that information yeah. to propagate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a fairly small effect, but it's probably something that you can see in like the best quality data that we have nowadays <laughs> with like really bright stars in, in um, the... Okay. Few I guess parts per million. How, how precise is the time of ingress you can measure? I guess that's it. It's not that precise, unfortunately, for, for this pipeline at least. Uh, it depends a lot on, on the data that you have and uh, how good your eclipsing binary model is. So that's probably something you want to do with, with Phoebe, for example, uh, a, a more complete um, uh, light curve model in terms of uh, physics. Okay, thanks. realize you'd see me. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, like, for non-spherical effects, rotation, Roche geometry, that sort of thing, obviously the fact that we need them to be eclipsing is a problem for Roche geometry in particular, but for rotation effects, is it just too degenerate with other things, like to see these in eclipse models, or like for really rapidly rotating stars and so on? Like, 
How would that um, manifest? I must say I'm not very certain of the effects of uh, strong rotation on, on all of these um, light curve effects. Um, but for example, for the uh, rose geometry, mm -hmm. um, we're actually helped a bit by the fact that they're an eclipsing system because at the moment of eclipse, they are aligned with our line of sight, right? So actually the geometry that we see is still quite close to circular. Right? Yeah, so, but that, that's unhelpful, right? Because then you can't, for example, isolate Roche geometry because it, you're missing that, if that makes sense. Like, I would call that unhelpful. But well, yeah. in this case, <laughs> it, it's helpful because the, the model that I use is yeah, for okay. circular stars, right? Sure, so. okay. Yeah, that was just wondering. I'm, what about disks? Like <laughs> <laughs> what about disks? <laughs> ah, good question. Um, they'll probably be very hard to, to model. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. That was just fun. <laughs> Hello. Um, so in your f in the, your first list of a human pipeline, as you you stated, so you mentioned the analysis of the residuals, and I did not find it back in your com computerized pipeline. So is that still something you do manually afterwards, or or how do you deal with it? Unfortunately, largely yes. Um, I've not found a simple ways to to automate that uh, that part yet. Um, other than saying machine learning or something, I don't know. <laughs> okay, and then what, a second question, if I if I may. Uh, so um, your last point, so what are the next steps that still need to be done before you get to that final result of testing tidal theory? Yeah, so I'm actually uh, quadrupling the size of my uh, eclipsing binary sample from tests. So that's something that is in the works uh, first. And then I'll be throwing uh, my uh, pipeline at all of those um, to get those eccentricity measurements. And then I can start thinking about uh, the, the whole sample as a population uh, and try to uh, break that down. Hey, Luke. Thanks, uh, th thanks for the interesting talk. So I had a question about your figure uh, where you show the comparison with theory. Uh, for the Kepler, yeah, this one. So have you tried binning this data or like try to like average it? Because it, it seems like I still see around like period of 10 days, there might be still quite a few number of points. Mm -hmm. It might not be a sharp transition, it might yeah. be like a... Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so that's indeed true. We see here that uh, this collection of uh, over d or over density of systems at zero eccentricity extends beyond this, uh, well, actually the critical period that I've used to draw this line. Um, and I've not like broken it down further uh, in this case, but um, actually theory tells us that even for the, um, the convective uh, envelope stars, which most of these uh, Kepler targets will probably be, um, there is a range in uh, expected um, critical periods that we find, um, also dependent on stellar size, for example. Yeah, thanks. So while you're on that plot, Luke, uh, you said and we see that your results are broadly consistent with the theory, but still there are few systems at very high eccentricities and short periods, so individual systems. What can you say about those? Are these the errors in your eccentricity measurements or it's physics? Yeah, so um, good question and of course the one I didn't want to answer. But um, we can see here that there's quite some uh, points still in the part where we do not expect um, systems. And I've looked into uh, these individually and most of them indeed are due to errors uh, in the analysis. Uh, most of them because of the secondary eclipse not being identified correctly. Or, in fact, some of them, I couldn't even identify a secondary eclipse myself, so no wonder that the analysis also couldn't uh, do that. Um, I've marked a few of these here in blue, and those systems actually had pretty good uh, solutions for their uh, light curves. Um, for those systems, though, uh, they were uh, a little bit uh, hotter uh, than most of the Kepler uh, eclipsing binaries, so it might actually be 
uh, still completely um, uh, uh, in accordance with the, with the theory as the, the hotter stars are expected to uh, not circularize as quickly. Thank you. More questions? Still have a couple of minutes, so time for one more question. Yeah, the last one, Nick. Thanks, Luke. I was just wondering, could it also be that these systems are just very young? That is definitely also a possibility. Um, for these systems, I don't think that's uh, necessarily the case, but um, yeah, it is definitely um, something that can be uh, a cause for this. So we just look at a very young system that didn't have a lot of time to circularize. Yeah. Thanks. All right. We are approaching the hour, so uh, let's thank Luke again. <laughs> and thank you to everyone for joining. See you next week. So Cleo is telling me that next week a uh, seminar will be in the in a different auditorium and for the rest of the semester, okay? So check the AdWawas page for the auditorium number. <laughs>